Experts meet to improve forestry benefits flow. EU celebrates 40 years friendship with P&G. And removed totems to return to Parliament. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me with Wednesday's news. A gathering of forestry and social science experts is looking for ways to improve the flow of benefits going to forest resource owners. The team is made up of local and international scientists who are also considering suggestions for regulatory changes. This group of experts from universities in the region are here to discuss ways in which benefits derived from forests can go to rural communities. The meeting held at the National Forest Research Institute in Leigh is geared towards the use of plantation forests and small-scale logging. The team is also looking at getting government to relax forestry regulations and to enable more participation by landowners. That project uh, in itself uh, therefore has uh, identified that there are a couple of uh, uh, areas and objectives that the project uh, would like to see them uh, having to improve their livelihoods in. And the one is the uh, uh, having to participate in the uh, reforestation programs uh, that uh, the government is uh, looking at, and that, uh, that is the Pining Ground Planning DUI. Also high on the agenda is the involvement of women in the forestry sector. In many cases, women are the worst affected in large-scale forestry ventures. Dr. Trevor Gates is the expert who is looking into that area of the project. I think it's important to talk with the people, um, to talk with the people that are affected by um, and that, that are participants in community forestry. And that includes talking to women. Small plantation forests are important. It is within this context that the team is working to develop the guidelines. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. The European Union today celebrated 40 years of bilateral relations with P&G. Information stalls were set up to give guests an insight into the work of the European Union in the country. EU's Ambassador Yanis Geokarakis Argyropoulos said the European Union will continue to strengthen ties with P&G that were first established in 1977. Hundreds turned up today at Rita Flynn Courts where the occasion marked PNG's 40-year partnership with the European Union was held. Visitors included students, corporate houses, diplomats and government officials led by Minister for National Planning Richard Maru. Hey. About 20 information booths were set up to give visitors a better understanding of the work of the European Union. National Planning Minister Richard Maru thanked EU Ambassador Yanis Giokarakis Agiropoulos for their help and support over the last 40 years. In short, thank you for your friendship and all that you've done for our country. We are extremely grateful. We want to also benefit the European Union in a far bigger way than we have been able to do. We are open. We are here. We are listening. We'll go out of our way to help the European Union member states. Let's look at the next 40 years where both of us can win out of a stronger relationship. Thank you. A day of stock taking, a day of, and a day of motivation and inspiration for the future. Capturing 40 years of partnership in just one event it is too ambitious. It's just a fraction of uh, what we have achieved together over these 40 years. I am very pleased, however, that the results of our partnership are visible. They have an impact to the local population. They have expanded from the traditional development cooperation to areas like trade and investment and political cooperation. And I look forward based on these results and experience, to continue working together with the government and people of Papua New Guinea for the betterment of the people and the development of the country and the nation. Thank you. Supported by EU's free trade agreement policy, two major companies, RD Tuna and Coffee Industries Cooperation, spoke about their exports to the European market. Uh, we are selling 100% containers, 100 containers per month to Europe. 
Oh. So far, so good because they will not repeat order if the product is not good. So since 2000, uh, 1997, I think, since the Arituna started, we sh before we only ship around 20 containers, then gradually the, the volume improves and now we are exporting 100 containers per month. So with that, I think uh, they are satisfied with the quality of our products. Yes, we, we, we do sell coffee to Japan, uh, America, Australia, uh, Germany. They are the main uh, purchasers of our coffee, but uh, recently we have uh, broken into the Korean market, the Asian market, the Indian market, and the uh, China, China market. Uh, it's, a, it's a pity that our people don't go back to the farm to farm coffee, because if, even before the uh, coffee for the flowers are on the trees, it's pre-sold. Like every bin of coffee is sold already. Before, because of the quality of the kind of coffee that we produce in PNG. Meanwhile, Minister Maru says one of the area of assistance for EU to look into will be education, especially Tibet program. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Meanwhile, MTV signed an agreement with the European Union ambassador to produce a documentary capturing the benefits and assistance between PNG and the EU that existed for 40 years. Writer, director and producer Marco Venditti says the documentary will take at least six months to make and will feature hundreds of villages in remote PNG. Upon signing the agreement, CEO of MTV, Matthew Park, says for the first time, MTV will work with European Union to create a major documentary on the work of EU in Papua New Guinea. We can assure you guys that it's going to be very different and not something you guys have seen before. I think um, I'm very confident in the ability of, of, of Marco and our MTV staff to be able to produce something very special for you guys and also to... Yeah, to be able to say it from a different point of view is something that um, we strive for is the uniqueness and to be able to um, highlight things that um, perhaps not the conventional eye might see. So, yeah. Writer, director and producer Marco Venditti says the documentary will be a challenge noting that a lot has happened in 40 years. Well, and I think at the end of the day, we don't know either. We can just think sitting behind the desk what this documentary will be about. And I know for a fact we're going to be wrong because it's only the story of the people that we will meet on the road. Their personal take will actually determine what this documentary will be about. European Ambassador Gio Karakis Agiropoulos who watched a one-minute promo of the documentary says it will be an interesting piece and says he looks forward to seeing the rest after the production is complete. I think that's a challenge of the film itself, is to raise the appetite for more. Yeah. And this yeah. exactly will be the taste to be left at the end of the film. Yeah. You want more. More partnership, <laughs> more Europe, more Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Yeah. The documentary, once completed, will be expected to air not only in PNG but also in Europe in March 2018. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Pango Party leader Sam Basil is now Minister for Communications, Information and Technology and Energy. He now takes over from Francis Maneke, who is now Minister without a portfolio. His ministry allocation announced by Prime Minister Peter O'Neill today. According to the Prime Minister, these changes in portfolios are aimed at strengthening the national government's focus on key growth sectors that will have a direct impact on business development and community advancement. Minister Basil will now be responsible for the communication, information and technology sector, which has been described as crucial for growing the country's modern economy. Among his responsibility areas, the national Information Communication Technology Authority or NICTA as well as the National Broadcaster NBC. He is also responsible for the energy sector which relates to research and generation of climate friendly energy sources, something which successive governments within the last decade have tried to embrace. Minister Basil's elevation follows his move to government in late September. National MTV News continues with more after the break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. 96 out of 661 refugees in Manus have opted to settle in the country. PNG migration officials say these refugees will sign up for a refugee visa under PNG's international obligations as a state party to the 1951 Refugee Convention. Chief Migration Officer Solomon Kanthas says the 96 will be helped to secure employment in the country. Mr. Kanthas said for the others, the PNG and Australia government are still looking for options. Meanwhile, the Manus Regional Processing Centre will cease operations on 31st October 2017. A refurbished dental facility will improve training and health service at UPNG School of Health and Medical Science. The facility was refurbished as part of the Development Corporation Treaty between the Australian and Papua New Guinea governments. Australia's High Commission Minister Councillor Benedict David said the Australian government will continue to be a reliable partner in education and health. The opening of the newly renovated outpatient dental facility signifies a start in improving dental services for the Port Moresby General Hospital and training of students practicing dentistry. Uh, the upgrades to the cl dental clinic that you will see here will provide dentistry students with improved facilities in which to obtain hands-on experience as part of their education. Uh, the re refurbished facility features eight new dental surgeries, specialist x-ray and sterilisation rooms, uh, and behind-the-scenes enhancements including refurbished electrical and mechanical and hydraulic services. The clinic not only provides students with better learning environment, uh, it will also provide an improved service to the people of Port Moresby and the surrounds who come here to access affordable dental care. So just to finish then, on behalf of uh, the Australian Government uh, and the Australian High Commission, um, we're very pleased to have supported this project uh, and we hope that it will assist the University of Papua New Guinea to attract and educate a new generation of health workers uh, to provide uh, that core health care to the, to the people of Papua New Guinea. The equipment will service the requirements of UPNG, the health department and the Port Mosby General Hospital. Services and the care is a challenge that, that we face uh, throughout the country and, and that's not been easy. Uh, as, as the Deputy Secretary for the National Health Service Standards, that's one of the concerns that I've had over the years in trying to help and facilitate and progress the, the issue so that dental service and care becomes a reality for all of our people. So many times I go on this Colgate toothbrush day and, you know, show my face and, and any other event that come in with, with dental uh, issues. I, I go there to try and facilitate that because many of our people have, have difficulty really accessing the care that's needed, even right down to, to the most peripheral. The dentistry division under the UPNG School of Health and Medical Science has three graduate programs and two postgraduate programs. The school has around 60 students who will benefit from this facility. Merlin Dakotam, National MTV News. Lay police arrested a 21-year-old man at a settlement today. He is a suspect to a murder of a security guard last week Friday. Lay's acting Metropolitan Superintendent Timothy Pomoso said the guard was attending to an attempted robbery that night when he was stabbed. Pomoso says investigation is in progress and further arrests will be made. Local community leaders in mine-impacted areas in Morabe want the 1992 Mining Act review to be passed in Parliament. This concern was raised at the Extractive Industries Forum in Ley by a community leader who says the country's mining industry is currently being governed with an outdated act. Community leaders in the mine-impacted areas in Morabe are awaiting the 1992 Mining Act review to be passed by Parliament. Ruben Mete is the president of the Watut River Communities Association in the Bulolo district and is vocal about the review of the Mining Act. And the government needs to push uh, what and come out clear whether uh, the current Mining Act 1992 will be, uh, will be approved or uh, we will go back with an outdated 1992 uh, Mining Act. PNG's Mining Act was reviewed to ensure better shares for landowners. The Prime Minister Peter O'Neill said last year that the changes to the Act would not be made prior to the 2017 national elections. The reviewed Act is yet to be passed. Uh, one of the things that the 
mining landowners are pushing, and especially all the uh, host communities and the impacted community, as well as the potential impacted communities. One of the ad agendas that they are pushing is to see an increase in the royalties payment. The Extractive Industries Forum provided an avenue for interest groups in Morobe to be informed about the benefits of their resources and to also raise concerns over mining matters. Mr. Meta said people living in impact communities hardly benefit from the mines. There are some uh, closes where there are funding funds for river communities, there are funds for settlement communities, there are also funding for uh, road, uh, highway corridor communities. None of those fundings are accessible. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. The traditional carvings removed from the Parliament House in 2013 will be restored and returned. Speaker of Parliament and Manus MP Job Pomat says the court has ruled for the return of the totems and other masks and the House will be tasked to execute the decision. Currently, the carvings are being kept at the National Museum and Art Gallery. After a year following the National Court ruling for the totem and carvings to be returned, Speaker of Parliament Joe Pomat is making attempts to effect the decision. Mr. Pomat says the court decision must be followed despite much criticism and discussions surrounding the issue. Because court and me decide in penis. Now court and me decide in penis, me must comply now. No decision block court. The totem and carvings were removed by former Speaker Theo Zirono in 2013. However, former East Sipi Governor Sir Michael Somare challenged the matter in court. In May 2016, the matter was pushed to the Supreme Court but was dismissed. The Speaker says the House will liaise with the National Museum and Gallery to have the carvings returned. That's all our artifacts here and come back in. So align the parliament by liaise one them align the museum, now this law, no make him this law work, now by him he must bring him back, this law hap to them while he cut him, he come back, now all this law mask, now one them stop on top of the lintel here, and come back. The speaker is also concerned with the amount of money used in the exercise between 2013 and 2016. He says an inquiry will be established before a report is tabled. And this is a project or program, and we, and we cost him government how much money. We must have a lot of this. All this reporting, I'm not meaning, but we can stop a better position to make him decision. You may throw me out, or you may put him in stop too. He set up when I'm half. Inside the yellow parliament, or outside the front of parliament, or when I'm half, all this looks up by Gambia. Meanwhile, the unity pillar will also be discussed regarding its status in the Parliament House. Jekyll Pava Jr. National MTV News. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3125 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.305 US dollars, 0.3849 Australian dollars, 0.2553 Euro and 33.85 Japanese Yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee, cocoa and copra closed the day higher. Crude oil closed higher while palm oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 40.48 points higher, the ASX closed at 0.87 points higher, and the Ordinary is closed at 3.26 points lower. National MTV News will be back with more after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, there's been a major step forward in the fight against ISIS in Syria. Three years after the group seized Raqqa and declared the city its capital, a U.S.-backed alliance of Kurdish and Arab troops have recaptured the area. ISIS insurgents once had a large part of Iraq and Syria under its control but are rapidly losing territory. At the heart of Raqqa, they're giddy with victory. The Syrian Democratic Forces control the city that the so-called Islamic State hailed as its capital. Paradise Circle, it's called, and here they beheaded people. Their hatred crossed continents. 
three years ago, IS did victory laps here. But their caliphate is now in ruins and they're on the run. It was Arab and Kurdish fighters, men and women, who did a jig celebrating the Islamic State group's retreat. The SDF fought in sandals and the most basic of weapons, but they had a killer advantage, coalition air power. That helped drive IS out, but it also emptied this city of quarter of a million people. Hundreds of civilians may have died in the Western bombardment. Yunus Omar and his family, though, survived. They've only just managed to escape. IS used them and thousands of others as human shields. His wife says, they shot at my family, but Allah is stronger than them. Yunus says, it was a horror. I tried to leave twice and couldn't. They were shooting at me. They said, you're escaping towards the infidels. But the final victory here was delivered not in a gun battle, but in a bus ride. Here, IS fighters are seen leaving one of their last holdouts, the National Hospital. They were guaranteed safe passage as part of a peace deal. What's left of Raqqa can barely be called a city. And still, dangers remain. The Islamic State's foreign fighters here vanished. Some may be hiding in these ruins. Their leadership have already fled. The Islamic State group may have abandoned their capital, but they haven't abandoned their cause. So the fight against IS goes on. 3,000 extremists are currently being investigated in Britain with a constant risk of terror attacks. That's according to the head of MI5, who has given a rare interview to defend the organization. Four terrorist attacks in Britain, inspired by so-called Islamic State, in the space of six months. Most of the attackers were already known to MI5, the security service. Today, its director general addressed journalists on the extent of the current threat. I asked him why MI5 was unable to stop those attacks by known extremists. The likelihood is that sometimes attacks can happen. We've seen that. I've also said the likelihood is that when an attack happens, it may be done by somebody that we know or have known at some point in the past. Were that not so, it would mean that we were looking completely in the wrong place. When three men attacked people with a van and knives in Southwark in June, it turned out their ringleader was this man, Kuram Butt, a well-known extremist already on MI5's radar. What's the point of surveillance if someone is, able to, is free to do that? One of the main challenges we've got is that we only ever have fragments of information and we have to try to assemble a picture of what might happen based on those fragments. MI5's list of 3,000 extremists includes returnees, jihadists coming back from the conflict zone. I asked Andrew Parker if he knew where they are now and what they're doing. So of that, over 800 people who have gone to Syria and Iraq, um, a proportion of them are back in the UK from several years ago, having given up on the fighting and come back for different reasons. And you're monitoring them. And they are part of that 3,000 number I spoke about, where they're sifted and assessed on an individual basis for risk, and we apply intelligence coverage and police coverage accordingly. MI5 says its director general cannot be 100% perfect. A total of five terrorist attacks have got through this year, against 20 stopped over four years. The UK, he says, will face down this challenging threat. New concerns about air safety in the sky are emerging in the US after a drone collided with a commercial plane for what's believed to be the first of its kind. The Federal Aviation Administration is now calling for emergency actions. This morning, investigators are looking into the first ever collision between a commercial plane and a drone. Officials say the drone slammed into a plane carrying six passengers and two crew members as it was about to land in Quebec City Thursday. This should not have happened. That drone should not have been there. This incident, just the latest in a series of close calls between drones and aircraft. We almost got hit by a drone, just to let you know up here. Just about 
20 feet. With more than 250 drone-related safety issues reported every month, that's up by more than 50 percent from last year. The FAA is now seeking new emergency action to ensure more drone flight plans are reviewed before takeoff. It was uh, just off of our left side, of maybe. Away. If you're flying a drone around an airport, you're putting people in danger. And it's not just commercial planes. Federal safety officials are now looking into an incident from last month when a drone hit the wing of an Army helicopter that was flying security for a meeting for the United Nations. Officials in California even arresting a drone pilot after his drone allegedly delayed some life-saving operations while trying to put out those massive fires. As drones continue to get bigger, more sophisticated, heavier, Heavier, wider, they're going to present an ever greater danger to the flying public. Anytime an airplane runs into an inanimate object, a heavy object, it's not going to do any good and it could eventually bring down an airplane. And back home, awareness for the Solwater One project is continuing for communities on the west coast of New Ireland. Developer Nautilus Minerals says consultation has progressed despite criticism of the environmental effects of the project. According to the developer, awareness has reached over 30,000 people out of nearly 50,000 people. The Solwater One project will be the next big mining project for New Ireland province. With the project set to begin in 2019, community awareness has been targeted for communities in the vicinity of the project area. According to the developer, the awareness is aimed to bring confidence to the local communities on the workflow of the seabed mining project. And we have given them updates on uh, where we are in terms of the project, um, we, where we are uh, in terms of the, uh, the equipment built, uh, how we're going to actually uh, mine when we start our, our operations in 2019. Natalus Minerals, along with other state agencies, including provincial and district officials, visited the west coast of Namatanai recently. Locals are new to the seabed mining concept, which will be the first in the country. However, some have confidence of reaping its benefits. I believe that we have to talk a bit too much about Natalus. Look forward to all something. The awareness drive has been ongoing in the past 10 years. According to SEPA officials, developer Natalus Minerals has satisfied most of the requirements of the Environment Act, despite stiff opposition from some communities within the area. Eventually, the environment permit was granted to them in, in 2009. Um, what is now left for them to do is to submit the environmental management and monitoring plan. For many, the Solwara One project will be the first major impact project near the shores. Others still have doubts, while others believe the project will help a lot in services they have never seen in the past 15 years. We look at uh, all the something where we go looking and by by him, one name talk talk. Now one story, all people of place have been hard and finished. Jack Lepave, Jr. National MTV News. True Guys Sport is up next. Don't go away. True Kai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The All Search PNG Orchids have named a team to play a warm up match in Cairns, Australia. The squad features Brisbane based forward Jasmine Taumafai. Australian resident Jasmine Taumafai, whose mother was born in Port Moresby, has been named in the 19 player All Search PNG Orchid squad for this weekend's warm up match against an invitational side at Innisfail outside of Cairns in Queensland, Australia. The team, uh, we got a recommendation from the Jillerus coach that we have some uh, PNG girls down there who can play for us. He, after the recommendation, we're able to establish a communication with her, and she's more than willing to, to team up with our kids. They will play the Mayor's Invitational side made up of players from North Queensland. The match will be a curtain racer to a pre World Cup warm up match between Tonga and Italy. 
Select the side from from Cairns. Uh, we'll be having a Cairns racer with them before the other uh, World Cup trial game that will be played. We got an invitation from them, and that is a game that we really need to go down there and play as that will give more confidence to the girls. Apart from having just one game under the belt, there's an international match. Orchid's captain Kathy Nepp says Tau Mafai's inclusion will bring a lot of experience to the team. Um, as the girls, we feel really, really good because she's be coming in from Australia, joining us. The experience that she's going to bring into the team and the exposure that she has, um, we'll learn from her as a team and we are looking forward to move forward in the game. This will be the Orchid's second match after playing the first against the Gilles in September. Firstly, we're really, really excited about this, the match leading up to the World Cup. And we're all looking forward to it and we're psyched up for the match. The team leaves this Thursday for the match on Friday at Calendar Park. The final 24 team for the Rugby League World Cup will be named next week. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The Rugby League World Cup will be held for the 15th time in 2017. It will be contested by 14 men's and 6 women's teams. 13 cities across Australia, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea will host matches with the finals to be played in Brisbane. Fans in Papua New Guinea can see every game on MTV, while in Australia and New Zealand, games will be broadcasted on Channel 7 and Sky Sports. Tonga coach Christian Wolf has slammed critics who were having a go at Jason Taumalolo and Andrew Fifita over the decision to play for Tonga. This comes after former Kiwi captain Benji Marshall openly regarded Taumalolo's move as disrespectful. And even Storm's Cooper Cronk said Fifita's move after being named in the Kangaroos was poor. The drama continues as critics voice displeasure over Andrew Fifita and Jason Tamalolo's move to Tonga. This time, Tongan coach Christian Wolf has had enough of it. Wolf came out in a column on Players Voice saying that was the kind of situation he had grown accustomed to after Tonga had long had to deal with players leaving the squad to join top tier nations. The irony is, this is the reverse situation of what happened five months ago when Cronulla Sharks forward Fifita pulled out after being listed to play for Tonga in representative rounds against Fiji and joined the Kangaroos for the mid-year test against the Kiwis. Coach Wolf further wrote, We understand it. We're very accustomed to it and there are usually three or four late call-ups for us. He added that every one of the players and support staff understand and support those players when it goes the other way and it is surprising how little consideration seems to have gone into the reverse situation. The coach further defended his team which also happens to have former New South Wales State of Origin stars Will Hopote, Daniel Tupo and Michael Jennings along with Kiwi veteran Manu Vatuve, all who chose Tonga over top tier nations. Tonga will take on New Zealand on November 11th in Hamilton. Dino Rose Rico, National MTV Sports. To golf, the Telecom Golf Pennant will stage its final round of the competition next month. The Golf Challenge teed off last weekend at the Royal Port Moresby Golf Course. Round 10 of the competition is currently underway with 12 participating teams supported by various business houses in the city. After round 9, Starland Dragons topped the ladder by 54 points, followed by Bank South Pacific and QPR Edaranu. The charity golf event will see its final round played on the 12th of November 2017. You're watching True Kai Sports. We'll be back with more after the break. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. Following round six of the World Cricket Championship, the PNG Hebo Baramandis, along with competition leader Netherlands, are now the first two teams to secure two of the four spots in the 2018 World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe. Baramandis now have another chance to vie for a World Cup spot once the World Cricket League Championship concludes. The International Cricket Council officially announced yesterday that the Hebo PNG Baramandis and Netherlands have booked a ticket to the ICC Cricket World Cup Qualifier 2018. 
With one round to go in the ICC World Cricket League Championship, Netherlands and the Barras advanced to the ICC Cricket World Cup qualifier after Hong Kong defeated Nepal in the final series of round six matches. Now after round six, Netherlands lead the WCLC standings on 18 points, while the Barras are in second place on 16 points. Not told of their mistakes, that's nicely whipped up. Those who have not qualified will go into the ICC World Cricket League Division 2 2018, and that includes Nepal, Namibia and the UAE for the WCLC, and Canada and Oman who have qualified for the ICC World Cricket League Division 3 for the six-team tournament. Dinero Sraiko, National MTV Sports. To football, tickets to the All Whites FIFA Russia World Cup playoff with Peru are quickly running out. New Zealand football had pre sold 25,000 tickets. With the first leg in Wellington mostly sorted, the most pressing issue for the All Whites now is how they'll get to Lima for the fixtures return leg. Flights to get the All Whites to the Peruvian capital could cost as much as two million dollars. New Zealand football CEO Andy Martin says both sides may even have to share a private flight to cut costs. And that's it for Trukai Sports. Weather details up next. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight in the southern region, rain showers in Port Mosby, Kerama, Alutau, and Popandita, and cloudy in Daru. In the Momasa region, rain showers in Leh, Wiwek and Vanimo and cloudy in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, rain showers in Loringau, cloudy in Kaviang and a shower or two in Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, rain showers expected in all centres. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. And before we go, they say being legally married comes with joy and blessings when two become one. At the weekend, 19 couples of the Gordon Seven Day Church in Port Moresby did just that to be legally recognized as husband and wife. Tying the knot late in life did not damper the spirit of the 19 couples as they joined hands for a proper wedding ceremony witnessed by hundreds, including their children, grandchildren and relatives. The ceremony ended with vows and the signing of marriage certificates. The mass wedding was facilitated by the director of the Central Papuan Mission, Pastor Simon Vitali. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, 18th of October 2017. From the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.